Howard, this book is coming out at the right time. And the reason why I feel that, and I don't know if it's because I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and that, that up there is really my territory to my all the way to my grave and beyond. But I mean, this story has fallen off the front page as well as page six of the newspaper. And with you putting our focus back into this story in this book, I'm, I'm just amazed that you had the, you've had the courage and the confidence to continue with this. Well, it was a perplexing mystery. And once I got out to Moscow, quite frankly, I was hooked. I mean, here you had four young, exuberant, beautiful kids killed for no apparent reason. You finally get a suspect, and he's a criminology student. He's trying to create the perfect crime, how the police got him, who the students were, how all the pieces come together. That was a story that I wanted to tell. And what I've been doing in my books for years is telling stories uh, and this is one I thought would, would interest readers. It certainly interested me. You know, you, you hit something there that I've, I've been a part of from the very beginning, and that is is that there it was a crime that we didn't understand why it happened, and yet inside your book, you you kind of kind of touch a little bit on a drug connection. Yes, I. You know, this is something that the prosecution uh, and the defense have, have been looking with. I'm not sure where ultimately it goes, but of the families of the of the victims, there, there are drug ties to some of the, 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 the parents and step parents. There also is a heavy drug traffic on mm. Greek row in, in the uh, fraternity community of the University of Idaho. Also, it should be pointed out that of the four uh, children who were killed, according to autopsies that I've been made privy to, there was no evidence of any drugs in any of their systems. So I think ultimately, you know, police are trying to make sense of what happened. I don't think the drug uh, explanation is going to pan out com- at all. What it, this was was a party house. I believe the suspect became fixated with really one of the women, Maddie Mogan. She was a waitress at a local restaurant in Moscow uh, where he would go for vegan or vegetarian meals. Uh, and they didn't even have to talk. He became fixated by her beauty, her exuberance, her vitality. And in her, his mind, I believe she, her presence became a, a constant rebuke to the life he was living on the periphery of events. I came across something yesterday that, that really opened up my eyes when it comes to crimes such as this. And it says it's no longer just about the DNA. It's also about the digital footprint. Are they looking into the digital footprint on this as well? Very much so. Uh, what what the suspect did, his phone is turned off for two hours on the night of the murder, from 247 to 448 when he was allegedly driving uh, to from Moscow, the 10 miles, uh, from Washington State, rather, to Moscow, those 10 miles. He claims during this time when his phone was turned off, he was up at a, a, a rural park looking at the stars at four in the morning, uh, where there are no witnesses and no cell phone towers to to uh, triangulate his phone. That doesn't really seem very convincing to me, but the, the digital footprints the police have found, it's not that his phone was in the area, that it was suddenly turned off uh, when the murders occurred. It's almost like the Sherlock Holmes story, uh, the, the dog who didn't bark, points to the killer Uh, and the police are using that to help make their case the name of the book that we're talking about is when the night comes falling this is the first time i've ever come across a book such as this that actually is a requiem for for the idaho students or for that matter for any victim children's lives one of the 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 students who was killed for example uh zanuck pernoodle at her high school graduation uh on the inside of her graduation cap her mortarboard she had written, for the lives I will change, mm. for the lives I will change. And the horrible tragedy of this whole story is that these students will never have the opportunity to affect any other lives ever again. Their lives were just cut short way too soon. You know, I got to tell you something, Howard, only because I'm also uh, an author. And that is, is that I, I, I would put you up on the stand because you've been there doing the research. You've been doing everything that that, you know, so many people only go so far. But you you have really dug into this case, into the way that you're wearing it now. And it's like, God, I would love to see you on the stand. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if they're going to call me, but it's interesting. I think the, the defense's strategy is <laughs> is to just 
for every expert that the prosecution has, they want to get another expert. For example, if you have someone who says this DNA is totally damning, they'll get another one with very good credentials with PhDs who'll say, well, this DNA actually is not as convincing as you see it. I mean, the dialectics of the courtroom are going to be uh, ultimately about one expert versus another expert. And that puts the suspect, as, particularly as they drag the trial out, uh, it takes longer and longer to go before a jury uh, in, in a better position. Have they tried to keep this story out of the headlines only because, I mean, with something as tragic as this, it's like it should be still there. It's, somebody should be stock, uh, still talking about it and not using it as some form of clickbait. <laughs> yes. I mean, the university has tried to make the wants to believe as if this didn't happen. Yeah, the yeah. house where the murders occurred was demolished last December on the university president's orders. They sent bulldozers as if that would, you know, you re- tear down the house and make it a vacant lot, and that would exercise the ghost. But, you know, th- these murders and these demons hang heavy over this little uh, town in Idaho and the families, too. And until there is a trial, until there is some sort of full resolution, I'm hoping my book will give some closure to the events and help explain to people what happened. We've never really really had the full story of Michael Koberger. I mean, I realize he's the father. It was part of the crisscrossing of the country and things like that. But we, we've never had the real identity laid before us. If I were to be picked as a juror, I would want to know what's going on here. Very much so. I mean, you talk about the cross-country trip. The book is structured around this cross-country trip. Here is a father, 68 years old, who comes out, flies out, to accompany his son on this trip across America going home for the holidays just after the murders. And the father is well aware that his son has psychological problems. He knows his son was a former heroin addict, and he knows the murders occurred just 10 miles away from the son's apartment. And he also knows, he's sitting shoulder to shoulder in it, in fact, that his son drives a white Hyundai Elantra. And the police just happened to send out a all points bulletin and looking for a white Hyundai Elantra. Hmm. So he's filled with suspicions. And as they go across country, and as I've been able to recreate from what people have told me about this trip, you can see the father's suspicions is as if he's following foot, footprints, and, and suddenly the footprints become bloody. He's realizing that, oh my gosh, perhaps my son is indeed a monster. And yet, even as he's coming to these suspicions, he can't quite get there. And when they get to Pennsylvania, uh, his his daughter, who's come home for the holidays, psychologist, notices how the son is behaving. Yep. He's cleaning his car obsessively. He's sorting his garbage into plastic bags and keeping it from the family's garbage uh, so the authorities can't get a hold of it. And she says, in effect, Dad, I think we've got a, a problem. Uh, I think Brian could be involved in those murders. And what does the father do? He can't quite face this realization. He just sort of shrugs and walks silently from the room. But Mm. there's a a coda to this this story. It's the father's DNA uh, that ultimately nails the son. It's like a Greek drama. The father, try as he might, can't escape his involvement and responsibility for his son's arrest. You know, the way that you described cleaning out that car, that is so Hollywood and so binge watchable. I mean, because, I mean, look at what happened with Brian Cranston in his new TV show, uh, Your Honor. I mean, the way that they go out there and they clean that car, I can visually see that. I mean, to me, it's like Hollywood has educated the murderer to clean up their own scene. All right. Well, and, and this murderer was a, uh, a criminology student. He yeah. had set out to, to create, I believe, the perfect crime to get away with it. And we will see what Hollywood does with it. It's been bought. Uh, my book to be made into a drama series. We'll see what, how they actually bring it to the screen. So as you travel around and continuing to dig in and locate new information, are you meeting up with other people that really are, are trying to keep this story alive as well? Because, I mean, Stephanie Lidecker and Courtney Armstrong have a podcast called The Idaho Massacre. I don't see a lot of journalists doing this story. So when I found out about your book, I'm going, hell yes, this, is, this needs to be out there. Well, I think it is getting out there. Be, you know, a week after publication, it became uh, both a New York Times bestseller and an Amazon bestseller. So I think there still is an appetite for the story, and, and there seems to be an interest in, in my book. And as I said, it's being turned into a drama series on one of the streamers. So I think the facts are going to get out there. Whether or not the trial will take place next June, where it's scheduled, or be further delayed, that I'm not too sure. Uh, the defense is 
hearing at, in August, on August 29th, for a change of venue. And if they can move the trial out of the little town of Moscow yep. to elsewhere in the state, well, that could delay things even longer. Wow. So on your side of it, let's 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 speak writer to writer here. When when you do the drama the way that you do, I mean, how is it that you're able to keep it in story form, knowing that the facts are right there in front of you and so easily you could become a news reporter, but you share it in a way that really does paint pictures inside our imagination? Well, thank you for that. And what I and it's something I've tried to do. You know, this is my 16th book Ooh. and I've been honing my craft since I was a young man just out of college, and now I'm, I'm fortunately or unfortunately a lot older. Uh, what I try to do is tell stories, and I try to find a way into the story. And you had mentioned this road trip across America. And when I first read about it, I thought that's a oh, pretty interesting, pretty, pretty cool situation. Here you have the, the father sitting shoulder to shoulder on this trip across you know, 3,000 miles, just about the width of the entire entire country, and it reminded me, not to sound too pretentious, uh, of Homer's, uh, you know, uh, in the Odyssey, Odysseus's trip, you know, 12-year trip, and what happens during the course of that trip, and and Homer flashes forward and backwards telling that story, and that's what I sort of, I use that ancient classical structure with all the facts I've been able to gather uh, and everything in, in the book is factually substantiated. Every quote is actual uh, to tell a story in a narrative that I hope a reader will find compelling and page turning. I wish I could have been a, a fly on your shoulder or inside a room for you to go knocking on other people's doors and sitting down to have dinner with people that knew the story or their interpretation of the story. I wouldn't even know how to get a conversation like that even started. <laughs> you know, one of the things you learn as a reporter is that people like to talk. I, yeah. As I said, I, you know, ever since I started doing this at, at the Times, it takes a while, but you try to build confidence and people will, will, will talk to you. I mean, because this is in their minds too and they want to share it ultimately uh, with people. It was harder in this story because of the, the gag order. And yes. one of the reasons why I wrote this book was the gag order, I believe it's been a tremendous mistake by the judge. In this vacuum, you get fatuous stories, sometimes downright vicious stories, and I thought it was time to try to get what actually happened out there for the people to read. And yet, and yet at the same time, Howard, uh, from, from what I get from your, from your book is that there is some secret evidence there. If we didn't have that gag order, people would be talking about this secret evidence of some way, somehow it would get out there. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> the secret evidence shouldn't be kept under lock and keys if they oh, do have it. Oh. I mean, they, they talk about secret evidence, but they haven't really given a hint of what it could be, and it would have come out by now. I'm not sure the secret evidence is actually so real. What they do have is they were able to get DNA, they were able to use a lab in Texas, and then pass this on to the FBI laboratory, and then build a family tree. Uh, it's called investigative genetic genealogy. And this family tree, the branches ultimately lead to a suspect who just happens to live 10 miles away from where the murders occurred and drives the same kind of car that was seen on the surveillance videos. In everything that you have researched and uncovered, did Brian premeditate this murder? Was there something in him that said, this is what's going to happen on this particular night. I don't care what's going on around me. It's going to happen. As I recreate the night of the murder, uh, you can see on the surveillance videos that this white Hyundai goes by the murder house, not once, not twice, but three times. Yep. And each time it drives off. And I don't think he's stalking the house. What he's doing, I believe, is trying to find the will, oh. trying to find the mindset that will allow him to become the monster that he feels he has to be. He knows he has to get his way make his way into that house because one of the people in that house is young girl maddie mogul is a rebuke to the life he is li li living he can't live in the world while she's living in the, in, in this world mm -hmm. and so he finally at, after trying to escape trying to not become the man that the demons are telling him to become he's pulled back as if by a magnet he stops on the top of a hill and it takes, I believe, the strength of Hercules for him to turn the ignition off. Mm. And then when he finally turns the ignition off, 
opens the car door, walks down this icy hill with a hunting knife in his hand. At that moment, there's no turning back. He's determined to be the murderer that he always had been envisioning in his mind. Do you think this this court case is going to be televised? Because this is the kind of stuff that we are so glued to. I think what the judge is talking about is having a modified television set up. Mm. But let, let's hope it is. I mean, I hope to cover the trial and I hope to be there and I hope to write about it. Let's get into the building of the book because you do something that's very interesting and, and maybe this is your editor, but I mean, the way that you are very creative in, in the chapters, they're set up like stories, the children's story, the hunter's story. It really does open up my heart to where it's like, okay, I can jump into the hunter's story. I'll get back to the children's story. You give me that opportunity to have that freedom. Yes. I mean, the book also to talk about the structure, it, it's uh, ended, uh, begins and ends with, with really with two Two fathers, yep. uh, Michael Koberger, the suspect's father, and then Steve Gonclavis, uh, the father of one of the victims. And, and both of them, both families really become victims in, in all this and what they go through. Uh, and I would like to, I try to tell the story th- as much as possible because I did not interview either of them. I, oh, wow. But I spoke to people close to them and, and there were public statements made and statements made by their lawyers what they were thinking and feeling as all this was taking place. And Steve Conclavis, uh, in my mind, the father of one of the victims, is a hero. He refuses to you know, allow his daughter's murderer to get away. He goes on the internet and says, we're coming to get you. Ooh. And it's a pledge, not just to himself, but also to the murderer to watch out. And he, he finds the will and the dogma to just not accept things, but to try to get to the bottom of things. And in the course of his doing this, he becomes deeper and his victimization becomes deeper and deeper and more intense because he just can't escape. Wow. Howard, you got to come back to this show anytime between now and when we get into this trial and after this trial, because I want to hear your story and your experiences as you bring it to us from day one all the way through. I'd love to. That'd be my pleasure. Excellent. Will you be brilliant today? Okay, sir? Okay, thank you. You too.